For our first session of AID 2021, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Joshua Romov. Dr. Romov earned his PhD from McGill University in 2021, where he worked on decomposing parts of the Bellman equation to improve the speed and scalability of reinforcement learning. Dr. Romov is currently a research and development scientist at Ubisoft LaForge, where he applies his work on reinforcement learning to game development. Thank you, Dr. Romov, for speaking today. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I have some really exciting work to share with all of you on the topic of deep reinforcement learning for video game development. So let's get started. Actually, the way I usually like to start my presentations is just with a quick teaser video just to get everyone excited. And so without further ado, let's watch it. And so this is actually a prototype we developed, which is running inside of a Ubisoft game called Hyperscape. The agent is trained to reach its goal, which is, which is directed by the green lines. And what you'll notice is that the agent has actually learned how to use jump pads and double jumps and all sorts of cool abilities like you'll notice right here. What's really nice is this, this agent is actually running inside the game engine itself. There's no cheating or anything like that. So the, 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 the agent's actually using a game pad. And so that's a brief teaser, uh, which, which I hope got everyone a little bit excited. But let's take a step back for a second and, and, uh, let me just introduce myself. So who am I? I'm an R&D scientist at Ubisoft La Forge, where I work on pushing the state of the art of deep reinforcement learning in the context of actual video games. Before joining Ubisoft, I completed my PhD at McGill University, where I focused on designing algorithms to scale up deep reinforcement learning. Very convenient. Ironically, though, my thesis work was more on the theoretical side, where the applications of the theory was always more in toyish tasks like Atari games, for instance. Not that there's anything wrong with Atari games, but at Ubisoft La Forge, the scale of the problems that we're trying to tackle is exponentially larger and more complex, as you just saw in the brief video, which makes for a very interesting day to day. And so just maybe to give you a bit more of a background on Ubisoft LaForge, Ubisoft LaForge is one of Ubisoft's research labs. And so we work together with professors and students from academia alongside technical people from video game productions. And by essentially bridging this gap between productions and academia, we identify interesting avenues for collaboration in several interesting research fields, including what you just saw, which was bots related, reinforcement learning related things, as well as sound, animation, physics, graphics, rendering, etc. All things that are related to video games. And so the research prototypes that we work on, if successful, which is not always the case, can get implemented directly into a game uh, for video game development. And also what we strive for uh, is potentially to publish papers at conferences as well. And so with that out of the way, here's the way the talk's going to go. Uh, I'm first going to talk about bots and reinforcement learning, which is essentially the main topic of the talk. Then I'm going to dive into more detail about a particular application of reinforcement learning for video game development, which is the navigation task. And hopefully by the end of this talk, um, I'm then going to conclude with a bunch of lessons and some future work that we're interested in, in pursuing. And so let's just dig in with bots and RL. And so not that I probably need to convince a lot of you, but why are, am I interested in bots? And it's not just because I've basically been working on reinforcement learning and bots related things for, for, for years. But, you know, maybe this statement, uh, you know, maybe it's a little bit debatable. But one thing, uh, you know, everything you can do, bots can do better, um, which might not necessarily be true in today's world. But that's where I would, and I think a lot of people would like uh, the state of the research to go. And so what are bots useful for in games? Um, and so I think one of the things that um, may not be immediately clear for everyone, because you're usually thinking about bots fighting against players, is for testing. Um, and so, of course, anyone who's worked on a video game production knows that testing a game is really important. Uh, so, for example, reachability tests. And so if we think about the prototype, the video, the teaser video I showed earlier, um, then reachability is definitely that was one of our targets. So can you uh, test your map to see if two points are reachable from one another? And this could be very useful um, in map design, for instance. Performance of the game, FPS drops, etc. You know, you could run several bots in your game and see uh, how the game is actually performing. Balancing different classes in your game or different instances, you could have bots battle against each other um, and see if there's any imbalance in your game. Just core gameplay mechanics as well. And so that's kind of on the testing side. You could test all of these things if you had uh, a viable bot. And then, of course, the more traditional, at least for me, the way to think about uh, bots is uh, bots that are going in front of the player. So I'm calling them playing bots, but really player-facing bots or any term you'd like to use is, 
fine as well. Uh, so one use would be onboarding bots. So when you first kick off a game as a player, usually there's a lot of complexities and it would be really nice if you had some bots there to guide you along the way instead of just being thrown into the deep end and getting completely destroyed by the amazing players that are very accustomed to the game. And so on that note, opponents for the player to play against um, for varying skill levels, not just onboarding, but potentially for even pro players, you know, if they could uh, play against bots that are at that caliber, that would be really interesting. Teammates is another avenue as well, because potentially you could have a multiplayer game where uh, players are dropping out. And so you could potentially want to replace these players uh, by bots, right? And so you could think about this as an increase in complexity and what's doable, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, you know, true for every case, but this is just something to keep in mind that there is a varying level of complexity for these tasks. And so the one thing you might be thinking, though, is, isn't this already solved? Can't we already create bots? Um, and of course we can. Of course we can create bots. Uh, that's not, we've been, you know, people in the video game industry have been creating bots for, for decades. That's not the problem. The problem is there is this disconnect between the NPC, the non-player character, the bot, and the player. And fundamentally, these two things have not been created equally. Um, and so... In an ideal world, maybe this isn't always the case, but in a lot of scenarios, you would actually like an NPC to be relatively close to what a player can do. And so say you wanted, in the scenario I was saying, where you wanted to replace players that dropped out of a multiplayer game with an NPC, well, this NPC better acts somewhat like a player, or you might have some, you might have an angry player base after you getting annoyed every time you have players dropping out. And that's just one instance. But essentially, the core is that as the games get bigger and more complex and have more features, bigger maps, et cetera, et cetera, um, this disconnect grows larger. And I'm going to go into more details later. This was very high level, I know. When I go into the navigation problem, I'm going to really tease this apart. And so then maybe there are some uh, out there thinking, well, why reinforcement learning? Why should I care about reinforcement learning? And so in a sense, this is the take home message. If there's one take home message of why reinforcement learning is that it's often easier to say what to do than how to do it. And what do I mean by that? Well, take any instance of trying to create a bot uh, in your game. If you have to specify in every state of the world, in every scenario, exactly what the bot has to do, this is going to be a tough task. This is going to take a lot of hours to develop and it'll never really be perfect because you can't possibly think of all of the different scenarios instead with reinforcement learning what's really nice is you give your rl agents some objective to maximize and so at a fundamental level you're not specifying exactly how the bot should do it the bot figures that out you just say what you want it to accomplish and so that's kind of at least at a high level why i love and i think why a lot of people love reinforcement learning it's for the potential for scalability and so if you're not familiar, I'm going to go over the reinforcement learning loop in a context of a simple game. Um, if you are familiar with reinforcement learning, this is still somewhat interesting, I hope. And so typically, well, this is the RL loop. You have an agent interacting with an environment. So you could have a bot playing a game, for instance. What game are we going to discuss in the simple context? Well, the classic game of tic-tac-toe. Very simple, right? Everyone kind of understands the idea. You want to get three of your token in a row. And you take alternating turns between you and the opponent. And so this is what we call the state of the world. Say the world would be the current board position, for instance. This would get passed to the agent, right? Um, as well as a signal telling the agent, a uh, reward signal telling the agent how well it just did. In this case, we're going to say the reward is zero. That's why it's grayed out. Because we don't really know, we don't want to bake in exactly what's a good board state and what's a bad board state. We just want to say, for now, in this simple case, we don't know if this is good or bad. And so we're just going to give the agent reward at zero. The agent then has to take an action. And so at first, it'll probably just be taking random actions. Uh, but eventually, you'd want it to learn what the optimal thing to do is. So say it stumbles randomly across this action, which is to place the X in the right box to win the game. Then what's going to happen? The environment's going to say, OK, this is the new state of the game. The game is over. You won the game. And you're going to get a nice, juicy reward, say, plus one for the agent's sake. The agent loves maximizing these plus ones. And that's it. 
you throw it into an RL training loop. There are many uh, RL and deep RL algorithms for more complicated problems. But essentially, simply by specifying the state of the game and the action space, what actions the agent's able to take, and the reward signal, in this case, plus one if it wins, say, minus one if it loses, you can have a bot trained to learn how to play Tic Tac Go in, in probably a matter of minutes. Um, which is awesome. And now, so what would, what, what would the alternative be? At least one alternative. If you think, take a step back and think, okay, what would we have done? Well, instead, we could have coded up the optimal action to do in every state. That's one option. We could say, okay, and given this board state, this is what you should do. Given this board state, this is what you should do. And of course, you could do that with tic-tac-toe. If I was coding up tic-tac-toe, that's probably what I would do. But as games scale, as the complexity scales, this no longer becomes a simple, easy thing to code up, and this becomes more difficult. And so that's kind of what's motivating us to use reinforcement learning for different solutions into different developments. And if you want to learn more about RL, here's a bunch of links. There's, of course, the, the classic reinforcement learning book and some implementations that are provided online for everyone to use. And so before we dig into our concrete navigation example, I just want to give some examples of training a deep RL agent inside a game. And I just want to caveat this. These are not actually being deployed in front of players necessarily, uh, but more just uh, a, a test bed and just proof of concepts. So say you wanted to learn to have an agent drive cars. And so this is what we did. We basically trained an agent uh, to learn how to, how to drive. And so we threw it in the game and we basically said, okay, you, you have to follow this path. And so we provided a path to the agent and the agent basically just had to provide the path. Um, and then we essentially, this is the end result is you have an agent and what's going to be really cool is it's going to come up to this jump. And it hasn't necessarily seen this jump specifically in its training, but it was able to adapt and accommodate these things without specific hard coding. The RL bot learned a mapping to actions, in this case, steering, accelerating, and braking, in order to follow its path. And so that's what's really neat about it. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, what, what was the point? You know, we could, we can code up uh, an RL agent. We, we, we can code up uh, a bot that could drive a car. It's not a big deal, but how is it typically done? And again, this often easier to say what to do than how to do it is each vehicle, every time you have a new car with new characteristics, you actually have to manually tweak a PID controller. And this is this could be painful. Instead, you could give all the characteristics and you could just run the simulations with the RL agent and you will have a bot that could, that could control that specific car. And what's even really cool is if you specify the characteristics as an input to the agent, this is just, I'm, I'm, I'm just divulging a little bit more information, you could potentially have one bot that can control them all, right? That can control all the cars, which is very cool. Very high level, because this is not the main focus of the talk, but I'm just going to go into another example. So say you wanted to have a bot that could fight in a game like For Honor, right? So we have this fighting game, um, and the AI bot is uh, further away in orange on the screen, and the uh, scripted bot, that's what I'm going to call it, is on the nearby side of the screen in blue. And so essentially, uh, we throw it in this loop where the RL bot is training against the uh, scripted bot, and essentially it learns how to beat it. And it's really, uh, it's really consistent. It learns how to consistently beat these bots. And so it's really cool. Um, and you might be thinking, okay, well, you know, that was clearly a pretty complicated example. And so are there any negatives of using reinforcement learning? And yeah. <laughs> it can get pretty expensive pretty fast. By expensive, I mean running many, many, many simulations. And so this is definitely something to keep in mind. So for example, on that setup here is kind of what the training loop would look like, at least the training setup would look like, is we set up a bunch of different agents in the game, fighting against each other at the same time. And so this would definitely generate a lot more experiences uh, than just running one match. This could be parallelized on multiple machines. And then the trainings can then be run on uh, on multiple machines as well. The updates to the model, and so it's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, is that you you know to train up RL to solve complicated tasks, um, you need a lot of training. And this is something I'm going to go into uh, much more detail later on in the talk when I talk about the lessons that we've learned. But this is just kind of here to give you a brief overview. And so another reason why you might not want to use reinforcement learning, but at least. You know, it's not that it's impossible to get around, but something to be hard to get exact behavior. 
Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, I'll just watch a video again in For Honor. And so here, what we did was we wanted um, the we wanted the agent essentially to defend more, and so we gave it a bonus reward for defending. And essentially, what ended up happening is the agent basically decided to never end the game. It just said, "Oh, you want me to defend? Okay, so I'm just going to be defending forever and ever and ever, and uh, I'm not going to win." And so, if you were trying to use this um, as a bot to actually go in front of a player, it's probably not what you would want, and it would be difficult to get the exact behavior that you want. If you really want a specific type of behavior, um, it's hard to quantify that into an objective for the reinforcement learning agent to maximize. And so, that's something to keep in mind. But what we've essentially learned is that Reinforcement learning is really good at maximizing that objective. And so if you can define a really well-defined slice of the problem, um, you're going to be really well off. The reinforcement learning agent is going to maximize that reward, and you should be good to go. And so with that in mind, let's now talk about a specific slice of the overall bots problem, an RL problem that we can actually tackle, and that's the navigation problem. And so you might be wondering, OK, but why focus on navigation? When, why, why is this an interesting slice of the problem? Um, and so the answer is that actually navigation is at the heart of all AI behavior in games. So if you recall all these examples of testing, reachability, performance, balancing, gameplay, and playing bots, onboarding, opponents, teammates, navigation is at the heart. If you want to have any AI perform any of these tasks, they need to be able to navigate, at least in classical types of games. And so you might be wondering, isn't navigation already solved? I mean, I, I said this before, can't we already make bots? Well, can't we already navigate? Um, and the answer is yes and no. And so we're going to go into uh, a much more detailed investigation into uh, the navigation problem. And so how is navigation classically done in games? And so just to give you an example, let's just first have this bit of a legend in terms of uh, what we're going to be seeing. And so we're going to have this agent who's trying to get to a goal, and he's going to have access to all of these different navigation abilities. And this is actually what's going to potentially break the classical navigation system. Not completely break it, but push it to its limit. And so the agent can go forward and backward, naturally. Go left and right, could rotate, it could jump, right? Pretty standard stuff. And now we're going to add some extra abilities just to make things a little bit more complicated. So for example, it could double jump. So at any point in its first jump, it can interrupt it with a second jump. Okay. And the final ability we're going to add right now is these things called jump pads. And so if the agent steps on these jump pads, it goes flying up in the air. And this is actually something that we saw in our original teaser video. So it is something that does happen in games, these extra navigation abilities. It's not just simply moving around anymore. There are, of course, other navigation abilities that we're not going to discuss right now, like grappling hooks and teleports and wall runs and all these other really cool abilities that make games fun and enjoyable. But for now, let's just focus on these. And so how is classical navigation done in games? And so here's a really simple example, a little top-down view of a really simple uh, world where you're trying to find a path from A to B. And so how is this done in games? Well, you're going to build a graph of traversable areas which is actually called a navigation mesh, or nav mesh for short. And so these are convex regions of the map. What's then going to happen is the nav mesh will be represented as a graph. And so you will then be able to find a path through these regions using shortest path algorithms like Dijkstra's algorithm or A star. And then you're typically going to smooth the path so the agent isn't just uh, running around um, a little bit all over the place. And then finally, the agent is going to follow this path. And so that's how it's done. Problem solved, right? Not necessarily, because it's actually pretty hard to scale this system to complex navigation actions. Not impossible, but very difficult. Uh, and so to see that, let's see what it actually means to build a nav, mesh, a nav mesh in practice and what the resulting nav mesh would look like. And so say we have this world with very simple, with a bunch of buildings with different floors and rooftops, etc. We have these two jump pads, notably, and we designed it specifically so that the rooftops are only accessible using either a double jump from the last floor or using one of the jump pads. So that's actually the only way to get to the roof. Now in blue, we've generated a nav mesh. And so you could actually now 
dig into what it means. So basically what's happened is we've generated the traversable areas. And so what you'll notice is that they're disconnected. And so there's a bunch of disconnected regions. The roofs are disconnected from each of the floors and the main floor is disconnected from the other uh, areas. And so now say we're trying to find a path. So we have our agents start off on this rooftop over here and we're trying to get to this other rooftop over there. And so one path you might think is just jump off the, jump off the first building, go to the jump pad, propel yourself to maybe the top floor if you can't get all the way to the roof, and then double jump to the roof. But it doesn't work because the jump pads, if you notice, are not taking account of the nav mesh, at least right now. Another path you might think is, okay, let's have the agent jump, jump off the building again, then go floor to floor, going to the roof. And again, maybe doing a double jump at the top. But once again, the floors are disconnected. And so essentially, this cannot be solved immediately from this nav mesh. And so how would you solve it traditionally is you would add these things called additional links. And so here is us at 20 times the speed, adding links stemming from one of the jump pads to connect to all of the different areas that you can get to. And essentially what would happen is you would uh, now be able to find a path because you have added this connection. But as you can imagine, that is actually just for one jump pad on one small map. And so this actually takes a while. This is actually very time consuming to do. And so in general, additional links scale poorly. And so what I mean by that, so on the x-axis, we're gonna plot the reach of the navigation ability. And on the y-axis, we're gonna talk about the number of links on a logarithmic scale. And so a jump could actually typically be handled very uh, relatively efficiently um, inside the nav mesh and could automatically generate them, no problem. But then you basically have an explosion in terms of the number of links that you need for a double jump. Because when you think about it, you'd have to, you're at every point in the first jump, you could interrupt it with another jump. And so the, the branching factor explodes. Similar with the jump pad, the amount of different areas you can get to. Effectively, you're creating a fully connected graph. And so similarly with jetpacks and teleports that we don't, we're not necessarily going to dive too much into in this talk, but they would be even more complex. And so what are the costs that we're talking about? We're talking about the building costs, so actually just building and compiling down this graph, the storage costs, just storing this immense graph with all of these uh, edges. And then finally, even if you could do it, right? even if you have this graph with all of these different connections, then finding a sh the shortest path through this graph would take a very long time. And so essentially what's gonna happen is you're gonna have to compromise between the cost of the navigation and the nav mesh completeness and so in practice, you're going to remove some of the abilities, right? So the bot will not be able to do everything that a player can do, right? And or you're going to prune most of the links. And so it won't be able to do what a player can do in all the different areas of the map. And so the key takeaway is that you can do this with additional links, potentially. In theory, it can be done. But it becomes intractable in large worlds with complex navigation abilities like we discussed with double jumps, jump pads, jet pads, teleports, etc. And so bringing this all back to our core problem that we discussed earlier is that there's this disconnect be between the non-player character, between the bot and the player. They're not created equally, even if you'd like them to be the same. And so fundamentally, the NPC gets a path from a nav mesh and then follows that path. Whereas a player, right, how does a player play the game? Well, it's watching a screen and it's actually moving sticks on a gamepad using opposable thumbs. And these are fundamentally different things, which means that you won't be able to test your game using bots like a player would play a game. It means you won't have bots that are acting exactly like a player. As much as you work on it, you can get something really close, but fundamentally there is this disconnect. And as the games get more complex, this divergence is going to grow. As the amount of abilities that you want to incorporate into your agent, this divergence grows. And so how can we actually scale uh, navigation systems to handle these complex abilities? That's the question. And so as you may have foreseen, I'm going to talk about a uh, deep reinforcement learning solution to the problem. And so let's dig in. So deep reinforcement learning for navigation uh, in games. And so we're going to have the map again, some representation, some representation of the map. The agent's going to need it, need to know what's going on in the world, but we're not going to use a nav mesh. Right? Then we're going to have our agent and it's going to be able to do all of the cool abilities that you'd want it to do like a player would. You're going to throw it into an RL training loop. You're going to train up a neural network that takes as input, again, some form of the uh, some form of the map, and it's going to output actions on a gamepad, exactly like a player would be outputting actions. 
And so what does our architecture look like for those familiar with neural network architectures? And it's not going to seem too crazy for those unfamiliar. I'm going to dig into it a bit, but hopefully not uh, uh, dig into too much detail so that it's overcomplicated. And so go from left to right, inputs to outputs. We have our observation on the left. And so if we focus in uh, on our observation, this is what the agent needs fundamentally to achieve its goal. And so what is the goal? What is the task? The task is to go from point A to point B. And so how is it going to do that? Uh, well, you're going to need to give it the relative goal position. Otherwise, it has no chance of doing this. Um, it needs to know other information, like what's its current speed, what's its acceleration, etc. Can it jump? All of these things that are fundamentally put into the world as limitations, the agent needs to know. For example, for example, say it's trying to use a jump pad. Uh, it would need to know how fast it's currently going before it actually uses that jump pad. The other part of the observation is the depth map, which is um, constructed by shooting out these things called raycasts uh, into the world, which basically just detect collisions. And so you end up with this depth map that the agent can use to avoid obstacles. With both of these, these get input to the neural network. And so we have our 2D convolutions, which are awesome at processing uh, image-like structures, like our depth map. And then they get passed through some other layers and into an LSTM which for those unfamiliar represents uh, some form of memory. And so the agent is able to keep track, at least to some degree, of where it's been so far in the episode. So say the agent gets uh, stuck at some dead end, it theoretically would have the capacity to be able to fact track, to find an alternative path. And then there's a mapping to the actions, which as you recall, are actions on a gamepad. And so this is what our agent used to operate. And so now, without further ado, let's actually see the full uncut video uh, instead of Hyperscape. And so what we see is this big open world that the agent is navigating. And the agent's again, if you recall, trying to find its way to the goal, which is directed by the green lines. We're about to see the agent use this tunnel over here to quickly be able to navigate to the other side and use this jump pad right now to be able to step on it and easily reach the rooftops. It also learned how to climb up walls and vault efficiently get to the goal. And now a new goal is spawned and the agent immediately jumps off the building in order to get to it as quickly as possible. And what you may or may not notice, but I'm going to point it out, is that the agent is actually jumping a lot. And this may be bothersome to some. This is because we haven't actually given him the ability to sprint yet. And so jumping, interestingly, is slightly faster or basically the same speed as walking. And so the agent learned that, hey, I might as well jump my way to the goal, maybe avoid some obstacles along the instead of walking in a straight line. And so this is actually an example of the agent just learning to maximize its reward. It's do exactly what it's tasked to do. What we did notice was that once we added the sprinting ability to the game, that this behavior was actually alleviated. And so we just saw the agent that jump pad over there, a version from the teaser, and we're going to see it manage to get its way towards the goal. And just want to crawl. This was not actually deployed in front of players. This was just used to test the game, test the reachability of the game. And so if you want additional details about this particular project, uh, feel free to check out the blog post uh, listed here, the full research paper, which is online, as well as the full 10 minute uncut video uh, on Hyperscape. And so with that in mind, let's dig into some lessons that we've learned along the way. Uh, and how you could potentially avoid the mistakes that we make. And so the first thing uh, that we noticed, the first thing that we noticed, the first thing that is really important to get this to actually work is to have some debug displays. So what you don't want to do is to run your RRL training blind and never look at anything that's going on in the game. And so what do I mean by that? Um, here's what the debug display would look like inside of Hyperscape. And so basically, this is, this is the snapshot, and the first thing you'll notice is all of the red spheres that indicate what the raycasts are colliding with. And so we could actually see if they're working properly. Um, and so, but that's not all. If we kind of dig in a little bit further, we could see all of the little state variables and the reward uh, variables that the, the agent is actually taking in as an input and the actions that it's outputting. And so essentially that's the main take-home message. If there, if there is one in terms of being able to train your bot properly is you have to visualize everything that's being input to the agent, everything that the agent's outputting, uh, including the reward function. Because if, I mean, it's a standard uh, expression, garbage in, garbage out, 
the RL agent will maximize whatever you give it. If the reward function's off, if you're, if you have the sign inverted, if your state isn't normalized, if all of these things aren't, uh, done properly, then you may have some issues. And so it's really just this intuitive thing. Just watch the agent play the game while visualizing, uh, all the inputs and outputs and rewards that you're giving it and see if everything lines up going literally frame by frame maybe 10 frames at a time, just to see that things are actually working. The second thing, that, like if there's another key to success that we should talk about, it's the framework to communicate between the game engine and the deep learning trainer. And this is something that there's different approaches that could work. I'm going to talk about uh, ours in particular that we found worked particularly well. And so this is kind of, this is a high level overview of what our training week would look like. And so we're actually going to embed uh, the neural network into the game engine. And so it's going to run as quickly as possible. It's going to be generating data. And essentially this data is going to get picked up um, and translated by a custom framework that we wrote, which then gets fed into our Python trainer. Uh, the Python trainer then performs model updates, which then uh, gets fed back into the game engine through the custom framework. So it's a very high level picture of how this works, uh, but hopefully you get the idea. And essentially, you're probably not going to be able to do this all on just one machine. And so overall, we'd have something like 225 agents running across five machines uh, to generate enough data uh, to have this training run in a reasonable amount of time, and that would be 12 to 15 hours. So essentially, overnight, you could have the results that you want, which is pretty important. Anything, in my opinion, over that time span makes it very difficult to debug and to iterate. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. And this could definitely be sped up, right? The, the faster, the better. So if you could run on more machines, if you could run uh, faster trainings, like go for it, it's worth it because you'll be able to iterate and find your bugs quicker. Okay. As you may have imagined, nothing is perfect. And in particular, uh, you know, even though I've been selling this idea, selling this project uh, pretty hard, um, there are limitations. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about them in this next section. And so the first thing you might be wondering uh, is, well, how much does it cost? Is this actually feasible to run in a game live? And so the cost, the overall cost, give you ballpark. If you're not familiar with what the cost would be, I'm going to give you a reference point in a second. It's about 0.3 to 1 millisecond per character per frame. And so how does this compare with the with the traditional nav mesh solution? Well, after talking to several productions, a, a, a typical, maybe an average path request could be also around. 0.3 milliseconds, but something to keep in mind is you typically don't need to be querying this every frame. You do one path request and you wait until you need to update the path. And so while this isn't always the case, say you're trying to follow a moving uh, character or player, so you might need multiple path requests, it's certainly not every frame. So definitely the DeepRL solution presented as is uh, is more expensive, but there is this additional cost, if you recall, with the nav mesh based approach for following the path. And so it's hard to make a concrete comparison between these two approaches because they are fundamentally different. Uh, but overall, we could say at this point that the DeepRL solution is more expensive. Um, and we could break that down a little bit more, but just for, just for, uh, just for reference, we've still seen it running with multiple agents in the game without having uh, a massive hit on a frame rate. So this could actually run in the game live, uh, without having a crazy hit on performance. So if you're curious about the actual breakdown uh, of, the, of the performance costs, here they are. And so actually, you could really separate this into two categories. So computing the rate casts, right? And that comes in at about two milliseconds. Um, and the neural network inference, so actually processing all those inputs, comes in at about 2.7 milliseconds. Critically, this does not have to be done every frame because the world around you isn't changing every frame. Right. And players aren't reacting. If you think about how this compares to a player, a player is not reacting on a frame by frame basis. Maybe the expert pros are reacting pretty frequently, but still not on a frame by frame basis. Um, and so what you could do if you have a fairly static world, at least in, in, our, in, 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 in our case, this was the case is we were only evaluating this every 10 frames. And actually we've tested it. You can go further than that. Um, and so definitely the cost gets amortized over that, uh, time frame. Now, besides for performance, you might have some other questions like, for example, okay, well, it looks like it's working pretty well. It looked like it navigated pretty well, pretty distant goals, actually. If you think back to our video 
those goals were pretty far. This wasn't like trying to navigate within a little room, right? It would use a jump pad. It would go across these massive, massively long areas in order to get to the goal. But how does it actually do? And the answer is that it certainly degrades with the distance. But that's kind of a pseudo metric because the reality is the distance, if you just give it a straight line and there's no obstacles along the way, it's actually not going to be difficult at all for it to solve uh, the task. It just so happens that the distance correlates strongly with uh, a difficult um, path that it needs to compute because it could potentially get caught in areas where it would have to backtrack. Say it gets caught uh, behind a f uh, some very large buildings, etc., where it has to navigate all the way around the building. So what we saw is that on a 200 by 200 meter map, which is still a decent size, I might add, uh, inside of Hyperscape, we had a 95% success rate. And this degraded uh, to 90% of the 400 by 400 meter map, and then once again to 74% on the full one kilometer by one kilometer map, which is not bad, but definitely an area that we identified as needing improvement. And so on a similar note, similar question that you might have is, well, can it navigate a map that it hasn't seen before? And what do I mean by that? And so say you trained it on one map, say 200 by 200 meters, uh, and this is a procedurally generated world, we're gonna get into that in a second, and then you want it to generalize to a new map. Well, how does that work? Um, and so if you just trained it on one map and you tried to try to have it generalize another map, it will work decently well in the sense that it will navigate locally very nicely because things will look very similar. Uh, but globally, it could basically that backtracking capability um, leaves uh, room to be desired. Like you want it to perform better. And so essentially, you could easily get caught uh, and stuck in certain areas um, if you try to navigate new maps that it hasn't seen. And so if we recall, one thing we, we mentioned is that, you know, it, reinforcement learning could definitely solve a well-defined slice of the problem. And so if you want it to generalize, this should be baked in to the training. Um, and so one thing we wanted to do is we wanted to say, okay, let's create this massive procedurally generated world um, and let's have it try to, to, to train on many maps, many, 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 many maps and see how well it could generalize. Quick. Uh, video of what I mean. And so basically, this, these are these uh, procedurally generated worlds and there's with, with buildings and jump pads and mountains and all sorts of cool things. There's uh, and, and the agents basically would train on a certain number of maps and then we would test them, to see how well they could generalize. Another option for the setup is just to generate really, really massive world over one kilometer by one kilometer and see how well it performed. And essentially, even with this training setup, even with the proper training setup, training on multiple maps, there was still a bottleneck. The agent was still not performing uh, perfectly well on very distant, very challenging goals. And so what we thought would be interesting would be to essentially think about the way the nav mesh was constructed by building a graph and try to incorporate that into our deep RL system. So we we're going to use our deep RL system to build up a graph. And so essentially, we're going to spawn nodes and we're going to run the agent to nearby nodes and see if they're connection. If connected, if the agent can reach these nearby nodes and they are connected, and we create an edge. Once we have that graph, we can then use it um, to actually find shortest paths all over again. And so I want to point out these are very sparsely connected. It's not nearly as dense as the nodes in a nav mesh. Um, and so we're going to have much fewer nodes overall. But essentially, even on really large maps, we can now see how the agent actually performs. And so essentially, the agent, even though it wasn't trained using this graph, it was just trained to solve uh, just to navigate from point A to point B, if you augment it with this graph, giving it these waypoints, because the agent was trained to go from point A to point B, you just input uh, another waypoint along the way, which was the output of uh, shortest path search, it actually works really nicely. And so that's actually what we're visualizing right now. Um, we're watching the agent use jump pads, etc., uh, to navigate towards its goal, but with these waypoints, already generated. And so this is just so this is just maybe another example of where deep RL can be very useful, but maybe isn't just the be all and end all solution. It solves a slice of the problem and it can be used and augmented by more conventional systems. So I know that was a lot of information, but let's just briefly wrap up with where we're at. And so if you recall the core problem was that the NPCs, the traditional NPCs in our games are not equivalent to players. They're not built the same way. In the navigation problem in particular, 
they got paths from a nav mesh and then simply followed that path, whereas players obviously don't get paths from a nav mesh, they watch a screen, and they move sticks on a gamepad. And what this effectively meant was that there was this divergence. And once we introduce complex navigation abilities, we could no longer emulate what a player could do. And this limits us in terms of testing and in terms of having realistic bots present in front of players. And of course, as our games get more and more complex, this problem is only going to grow. And so essentially what we propose is to use DeepRL, um, which effectively uses a gamepad, but not just the gamepad, it effectively gets us closer to the way players interact with our games, which means that we are getting there, not completely there, but at least in terms of the navigation problem, we're pretty much there. And so we just wanted to thank all of our collaborators, the La Force SmartBots team, the technology group, the productions, the people in academia, and uh, everyone that's been supporting us along the way. Thank you.